I'd rather be the U.S. than China. China's in even worse shape for different reasons. Um, it's not so much interest rate policy, although they're they're subject to global interest rate policy and exchange rates coming from the Fed. But uh, you can see it in real estate. It's a full scale collapse. Uh, they're, they're propping it up, but, um, the, the, the buyers aren't interested. In other words, the, the Chinese government is telling the banks to lend money to real estate developers who can't finish housing. Well, that sounds good. It's like, okay, here's some money, finish the housing. But the buyers are not flocking in. The buyers have been burned. They're shying away from that asset class. They want to increase cash. They're looking at other asset classes. They don't have a lot of choices because, China has very strict capital controls. They're trying to get their money out by means legal and illegal. Uh, they're buying gold when they can. Um, but uh, as I say, they may not have a lot of choices, but even money in the bank looks pretty good compared to what's going on in real estate. The problem is too big. The bubble is too large. It's gone on for too long. We don't hear about it the same way we did about the Japanese real estate bubble in 1989, 1990. That was an epic crash. Uh, Japan is still not recovered. I remember in the 90s, Early 2000s, they talked about the lost decade. Well, try three lost decades. That's going into a fourth. Uh, that's Japan, you know, eight or I've lost count, actually, eight or nine recessions since 1989. But it's really just one long depression. That's the way to understand the Japanese economy. China's going into something like that. We don't hear much about it because they're not transparent. They lie about their numbers. You, you need to look at private sources and other use other, other analytic tools to understand what's going on there. Uh, but they've got um, you know, drops in consumption, industrial output, real estate's collapsing, uh, their price indices are collapsing, all this infl- fear of inflation. It's been around, it's real, but it's now turning around very quickly. And you can see that in China. China's gone through something that the world has never seen. Uh, it is a, they're going to lose 600 million people in the next 50 to 70 years. This is a demographic implosion. This is worse than the Black Death. Of course, the Black Death uh, killed somewhere between a third and half the population of Europe in the uh, 14th century. Um, uh, It was a good time for uh, for labor, by the way. Uh, The the labor was so scarce that returns to labor went up versus returns to capital uh, because there weren't enough workers. Uh, But that's the only thing uh, that can come close even the uh, you know the Spanish flu of 1919 killed about no no one's certain of the number but but between 100 million and maybe over 200 million people the Thirty Years War was certainly you know in the early 17th century was certainly highly destructive but what's going on in China now is is worse than any of those things um, you know it has to do with math, you know simple demographic math uh, the key number is 2.1 two people have to produce 2.1 children a you know, man and woman or you can say per woman if you if you want uh have to produce 2.1 children to keep the population constant why not two why not two producing two the answer is infant mortality and those who don't make it to uh adulthood and can continue the uh repopulation of the planet uh if you will but they're not even close to that. They're well below two. And by the way, so is so is the rest of the world. So is Australia and the US and Western Europe and a lot of other places. This is a global phenomenon, but it's particularly acute in China. Maybe the case that China's uh replacement rate is uh or or birth rate is actually one. Uh it has to be two point one to maintain. It could be one or lower. Uh this is a, a demographic implosion, unlike anything ever seen uh, anyone's ever seen. It also has a dynamic. You can't reverse it very quickly. It, it feeds on itself, as I was talking about inflation earlier. So uh, this is going to continue for 50 to 75 years. Uh, they're going to lose 600 million people. There are a lot of definitions of GDP, a four or five part definition. They're more complex calculations. But there's one really simple definition. It only has two factors, population and productivity. How many people are working and how productive are they? That's nominal GDP. It's, that's one definition of gross GDP uh, or, or nominal uh, GDP. Well, if your population is dropping from 1.4 billion to 800 million, you're losing 600 million people. Uh, and then what about productivity? Well, the other thing that's going on is China's population is aging very quickly. So you get a population set people in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, with very large amounts of um cognitive decline, dementia. Uh, obviously, there's no productivity there, but it's worse than that because then you look at the shrinking population between the ages of 25 and 54. It's called their prime working age. More and more of those people are going to have to be involved in elder care. They're going to have to be basically caretakers or caregivers 
for the older population I described. A very worthy job, but not one that lends itself to productivity gains. Um, bathing hasn't changed in about 5,000 years. Robots don't do baths. Um, the only real innovation in bathing in uh, between 1870 and 1940, we did see the rise of indoor plumbing and hot water. That's good. Um, I, I enjoy both, but, um, but that's it. We, I can't think of any other bathing innovations, uh, in, in the last several millennia. So if you have a shrinking working age population, a rising older population, high degree of cognitive decline and a big slice of the working age population having to provide elder care or be caregivers for the older population. Tell me where your industrial output's coming from. Tell me where your productivity is coming from. And, uh, sorry if I mentioned this already, but 50% of the water in China is poisoned, uh, because of, you know, just their industrial practices. You know, they, they, uh, if you're a gold miner in Australia, I invest in gold mines around the world. I know that places like Canada, the U.S. and, uh, Australia, if you use cyanide to leach the gold, and that's a very common technique, you have to account for every, you know, microgram. You, you know, whatever you put in, you got to take out, weigh it, dispose of it properly. In China, they just dump it into the rivers. And so the rivers are poison. Um, so China is, uh, uh, an economic, demographic, industrial, moral, religious, uh, wasteland and, uh, will suffer. It's, it's already in a recession just to, just to cut to the chase. Again, they lie about their statistics. So, so here you have the two largest economies in the world, U.S. and China. U.S. is slowly going into what I expect will be a severe recession. China is in a century long decline, uh, unlike one that the world has ever seen. Um, that could eventually lead to social unrest and a regime change, but let's not count on that in the short run. Just expect China to um, to shrink and become more autarkic, decoupled from the Western world, and uh, certainly not be a, a source of growth. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the largest and most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturing in the world. And semiconductors are in everything. It's not just computers. There are 1,400 semiconductors in an automobile. Uh, there's a semiconductor or more in your your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your washing machine, they're everywhere. Internet of things. We all understand that. Um, so TSMC based in Taiwan. Uh, the United States has a military doctrine called the broken nest theory. And what it says is that if China, well, it comes from a Chinese proverb, ironically, and it says, if the nest is broken, how can the eggs survive? Um, and what it means is that if China invades Taiwan, and I'm not forecasting an invasion, could happen though, um, we or the Taiwanese will very quickly destroy all the semiconductor manufacturers in Taiwan. We'll just blow them up and China won't get anything. They'll have the broken nest. Taiwan Semiconductor knows this. Um, they talked to the U.S. intelligence and military. He was on the short list to be nominated to the Board of Governors in Washington to fill the seat that Lael Brainerd left. Lael Brainerd was a um, member of the Board of Governors, I believe she was vice chairman, uh, but she left to go to the White House uh, in the National Economic Council. She, but she, she really is smart. She's, she's a big brain. Like she, she knows what she's talking about. Very few of them do, but she's one of them. But she goes to the White House, but that's an audition for Secretary of the Treasury, because they're going to throw Yellen under the bus. Yellen knows nothing. If Yellen were on this call right now, she wouldn't know anything we're talking about. How is that she, possible, a, Jim? Affirmative action. She's a, uh, she's a, uh, when she was chairman of the Fed, I said she was incompetent and I was right. And then she became Secretary of the Treasury. She, she's a, she's a statistics geek from Berkeley. She, uh, she's got a big brain. I'll give her credit on IQ points. So what? That's not the same as common sense or, or working knowledge or knowing how the street works. She's never worked, you know, outside of government in her entire life. I don't care what your resume is. If you've never run a business, met a payroll, um, you know, negotiated a person's sale agreement, um, you know, had kept your morale up with negative cash flow. If you've never done any of those things, um, you don't know what it's like to be in the, in the real world of the economy. She doesn't, but she, but her specialty as an economist was, was labor economics. Okay. Well, there's a place for that, but not, not as U.S. Tre treasury secretary. You have to know, mon she didn't know monetary policy of the Fed. She doesn't know fiscal policy of the treasury. Knows no nothing about international economics. And that gets us into the, the role of the dollar. She's just, she was like, a. Her husband won a Nobel Prize. Okay, George Akerlof. I know a lot of her close associates. Um, she, you know, if you don't want to say affirmative action, you can say the Peter Principle. 
uh, which, you know, this goes back to the 60s. But the Peter principle is you, you get in a bureaucracy and you do a good job and they give you a promotion. And then you keep doing a good job and they give you another promotion and you keep doing a good job. And eventually you get to promote it to something where you're incompetent. You're actually, you're in over your head and you fail, but then you stay there because because you're not getting another promotion um and so the result is bureaucracies are populated with incompetent people because they've all risen to their level of incompetence and have nowhere else to go i would say she got there the fed how she got another chance at treasury but that's you know that that's the answer um and uh but but leo brainerd i'll say is uh is more talented and hopefully she'll be so they'll throw you on under the bus blame her that's by the way that's the biden technique deflection and and denial and uh just blaming other people so they'll blame her for the whole thing she probably doesn't see that coming by the way maybe she should tune into london real and then uh, then they'll put little brainerd over there but mary daly was on the short list to fill brainerd's seat at the fed well you can forget that she can't get the hearing at this point but she was um running around on you know climate change uh social justice uh george floyd blm and again free country you want to express if you be my guest but not as chief regulator of silicon valley bank yeah yeah it's uh so should they have let it fail and what would have been the carnage jim if they had well again this is hindsight it shouldn't have been allowed to get to that place anyway but there might have been more this is where there's a lack of creativity it's kind of all or nothing say like, oh if this fails we're going to have a bunch we're going to have a wave of failures of startups in silicon valley well, that's probably true probably true um but most of them fail anyway <laughs> if you know the venture capital business and i'm sure you do uh most of these things fail anyway a couple of winners here and there well if how difficult would it have been so now you're the entrepreneur you had a five you had five million dollars of working capital which you got in a, a round you know an angel round or whatever from some venture capitalists in silicon valley you got some premises you got a payroll you got some developers you got employees all that stuff and now your cash is frozen not just frozen but gone you got a go yang money you know you got a do bill from the fdic um if those now who's to say if those companies were well run and they actually had some good technology how difficult would it have been to make a few phone calls and say you know what we're stuck in this thing um i need a i need a two-year bridge loan or i need a one-year bridge loan uh and uh, i'll collateralize it by the proceeds of my receivership certificate and as and when i get paid i'll pay down the loan we can have a simultaneous closing all good you you could have got money the, those some of those friends could have got money some of them not um maybe some layoffs uh maybe they would have failed and but most of them do anyway i mean that's my first point but that was not the majority of and you know unemployment would have gone up i mean i'm not saying that there are no hardships brian but but we gloss over the greater hardships on the economy as a whole and that gets to the other lie which was janet yellen coming out and saying um there's no cost to the taxpayer like wait a second because <laughs> you could you mention the bailout of the fed taking the loans below market value and giving them you know uh, uh, yeah uh, so at market value and giving them par value which is more for one year and glossed over that whole thing um but there was a separate bailout which is the fdic guaranteed every penny of every deposit in all those banks well when you look at the numbers you have grossly uh, depleted the insurance fund the fdic is an insurance company it's that's what the i stands for uh and um they have reserves just like every other insurance company they charge premiums that's how they go uh this would have basically wiped out the reserves so how are you going to top up the reserves in the fdic for future bank failures well they said we're going to raise premiums on the banks okay they are but uh, what do the banks do well they're going to either pay you less interest or charge you fees in other words that the bank isn't just going to sit there and write checks to the fdic and, and watch their p l evaporate they're going to pass the cost on to the customer which is us which is the american people so is, does your tax bill go up no but your interest rates going down or your banking fees are going up so the cost is shifted to everyday americans so don't tell me that we're not paying the bill because we are so again these are these are in the the nature of government lies to kind of you know disguise what they're actually doing i uh well i don't have a hundred billion dollars so maybe there maybe there's a level where you got enough money and it's not your primary concern um it, it, you know i like making money but it's not what the first thing i think about when i wake up in the morning the first thing i think about is how do you you know solve problems and what's going on um and you know it must seems to have 
some of that, maybe more than a little. Uh, you know, look, if you don't have free speech and you abandon the Constitution, I mean, is this is this like the uh, the fall of the Roman Republic? I mean, it, it, there's a little bit of a um, uncomfortable resemblance. Uh, again, going back to what we said earlier, you got to you got to study history. It's not it's it's certainly not the same, but there's no better playbook for doing analysis and a really good understanding of history. It's why um, today in America, and I would say. Uh, not just communists, but neo-fascists and other forms of dictators, and we have plenty of those in Washington. The, one of the first things they kill in the curriculum is history. They stop teaching it because if you knew a lot of history, you'd see you'd see these things for what they are. Um, but um, but I, I have some pretty good history teachers, and I've always been interested in it. So uh, yeah, I was um, I was shocked by what's revealed, even though I've been around enough to maybe maybe not be shocked, but but just the extent of it and and the depth of it, and uh, I um, have a lot of sympathy for the uh, users who were suppressed and squashed and deplatformed, and even more sympathy for the victims of that kind of censorship. So we were on the front lines of that information war in 2020. And so when I see these files, I see it from a slightly different angle. I mean, April 6, 2020, we had the second largest YouTube live stream in the world that day, Jim. 65,000 concurrent viewers watch me in this studio uh, have a two and a half hour conversation where things were questioned as far as efficacy of a PCR test, masks, future vaccination policies, which were really early. Even origination of the virus might have come out of Wuhan, something they'd literally almost lock you up if you had mentioned that in April right. of 2020. 30 minutes after that, Jim, for the first time in my nine year history of London Real, a video of mine on YouTube was deleted and banned. And right. I thought, what is going on here? I thought the weirdos are the people that got censored in this world. And then after that, I was subsequently banned, shadow banned from the following platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Dropbox, PayPal, right? With yep. Six figures yep. of balances on PayPal. Dropbox, where I didn't think they were watching my videos. I mean, that's technically right. my information. And again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I leave that to the guests on my show that come on because I think they have the right for free speech and we should all listen to what they have to say. But when I saw those Twitter files for the first time, Jim, I thought, okay, if there was a coordinated effort, it would have to come from a single source and why not come from someone who was trying to say, please, can we stop people talking about X? So I saw right. it in a slightly different state to where I was like, oh, okay, now I could see maybe how that coordination could happen. Um, yeah, and I like, I like the way you put it, Brian. You said with with this guest, this particular show, you were questioning things. You weren't being categorical about this. Uh, you say, well, maybe it did come from Wuhan. And it was, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, my my book, the um, the New Great Depression, came out in January 2021. Uh, interestingly, the publication date was supply, was delayed because of the supply chain, which was my next book. But um, I had it pretty much done by the summer 2020. And what strikes me was. The evidence was there then. Now, two years later, you know, you're watching uh, whatever Tucker Carlson or, you know, Alex Berenson or others. I'm sure there are many in the UK and they're saying, well, you know, did you, do you know that the masks don't work and the lockdowns don't work? And this thing looks like it came from Wuhan. I was like, yeah, I do. And I said that in 2020, but the point is the evidence was there. It wasn't guesswork. I'll give you a real, real quick example. Um, the leading epidemiologist for virologists of the 20th century, maybe all time, is Dr. D.A. Henderson. Now, D.A. Henderson is not a household name, but if there's a single individual most responsible for eradicating smallpox on the planet Earth, it was D.A. Henderson. He won the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is our highest civilian honor, equivalent to the Congressional Medal of Honor in the military, um, dean of the uh, Bloomberg John Southkin School of Public Health. I mean, you know, you, you can't go any higher in the profession, have more respect than D.A. Henderson. He wrote a paper in 2005 that said lockdowns don't work. Um, and he had the research to back it up. This was at the time, I believe it was the swine flu was going on. There was an avian flu and a swine flu during the Bush administration. Bush was actually very concerned about it. And Henderson wrote those papers that they don't work. Uh, and I cited that in my book. But the point is, we didn't have to wait until 2021 or 2022, or in China's case, you know, today, to find out that lockdowns don't work. In 2020, we had a paper from 2005 
that said the same thing. He said, if you have an island and there's no airstrip and only one way in or out and you got 100 people, maybe. But that's not North America. That's not Europe. That's not the world. They just don't work. Um, well, if we knew that from the leading epidemiologist, maybe of all time, uh, why didn't we follow that advice? Well, the answer was it was a hidden agenda. They they wanted to shut they wanted to shut people down. They wanted to um, uh, basically the, the the inner we empowered the inner fascists uh, in in all these government bureaucrats. Uh, I mean, it was it, it was Black Charles, it was Fisher Black, Myron Charles, but there was a third contributor, and he won the Nobel Prize, which was uh, Robert C. Merton. Merton, yeah. Uh, Merton was at Harvard, and 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 Fisher and Myron had worked on this for a long time and had come close, but weren't all the way there. They went to Merton to help with the math, actually. And Merton solved the math problem for them, but to his credit, a very generous, another really, really nice guy, uh, he said, look, you guys go ahead and publish this, and then I'll I'll tag along a few months later with my contribution. And the, the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. So Fisher Black sadly died before they got the prize. So Merton and um and Scholes won the prize and again to their credit they pulled the award divided by three and gave one third to Fisher's widow which I thought was very you know appropriate and um uh you know very uh very uh, generous of them but uh yeah it was a math problem you write about what they call Brownian motion which is random and you know so it was sort of you had a a fan if you will of probabilities um and then you know different um different degree distributions some more likely than others etc having said that um and you know the success of myron used to say you know jim if, if only i had patented the idea <laughs> and had like a fraction of a penny on all the notional value i'd be the richest man in the world which is probably true yeah. um yeah. but they didn't they they put it in an academic uh, journal but um uh there are there are assumptions in black shoals which you can question i'm not ding in the model science is always hey let's make it better it doesn't mean you don't use what you have um but uh they assume a risk-free rate well is there really anything like is there a risk-free rate is the united states risk-free i i don't think so actually and it's getting riskier by the day so you can kind of question that assumption um does the the future resemble the past with some probability some degree of distribution probability not always i mean and maybe less frequently now than ever and they also assume that prices move continuously you know, prices go up and down of course but that you could get if it were going up you could get out of certain levels if it were going down you could put stop losses on your position and get out of certain levels you could manage it and of course that was a big contributor to the uh, 1987 uh, october 19 1987 flash crash when the market fell 22 percent in one day i mean today we get worked up if it's down 22 percent a year which it was last year uh, approximately but this is 22 percent in one day but uh, it turns out none of that's true um markets don't move continuously or if they do it's when you don't care when you do care they just gap they get gap down or they gap up you miss it you blink and it's at a completely different level it's been repriced now you can still get in and out but you've either made a lot of money or lost a lot of money you know in the blink of an eye so when you take those characteristics, and this is how I started kind of you know, deconstructing it, if you will, and said, well, look, markets are not efficient. That's nonsense. They don't move continuously and slowly. They gap up and they gap down. And if you're not ready for that, you've missed the boat. Um, nothing's risk-free, so why don't we start there? When I started identifying those factors that, in my view, were incorrectly applied um, in long-term capital, but really everywhere, um, and you say, well, what, what looks like that? Well, the answer is a complex dynamic system, you know, a system that produces hurricanes and tornadoes and lightning bolts and power outages and earthquakes and tsunamis. Those are all examples of the results of complex dynamic systems. An earthquake doesn't sneak up on you. It just, you know, it just, <laughs> the ground falls out from under you instantly. Um, and that's what happens in markets. So then I said, well, maybe that's a better model. Of course it, it, it is. So you make a point, Brian. So let's go back to um, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, the Latin American debt crisis, broadly defined in the early 1980s. Th that played out at the intense phase lasted about three years, you know, 82, 83, 84. It wasn't until 1990 that we got around to Brady bonds, which were the ultimate refancy, refinancing technique. But the intense period lasted about three years. Come forward to 1998, long term capital management. That it was about three months. That was uh, July, August, September, 1998. 
SVB was three days or less. It was like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and done. Um, and you know, I, I talked to a guy, no, no reason to mention names, but you know, uh, um, runs runs a very one of the largest uh, endowments uh, in the world. And he said, Jim, we moved, uh, we we were moving eight billion dollars out of Silicon Valley Bank, and we got the wire transfer request in, but. We didn't know because you know you get to close business Thursday. We didn't know until Sunday that the money was going to move. We got a confirmation on Monday. We didn't end up moving the money, but there was this about a forty-eight hour period there from Friday to Sunday when no one knew that the thing the wires had been completed. The recipients didn't have them. It was just in limbo, um, and uh, uh, you know and it worked out. Um, one of the big crypto promoters um they um uh, forget the name of, well the particular name of the bank but they back one of the uh um one of the stable coins actually it's usdc yeah. uh had three three billion dollars in silicon valley bank and they talked about you know all these small entrepreneurs and startups they got 100 employees and five million working capital and that money's gone and they're all going to fail there was something to that but uh the fact is you had roku uh uh, Cisco, uh, eBay. I mean, there were huge companies with multi-billion dollar deposits in that bank. It wasn't all uh, all a bunch of little guys. So, um, but yeah, you can, uh, yeah, in the old days, you have to line up around the, the block and maybe it was raining, you're standing there in the rain waiting for your turn to get up to the tower. Now you can be in line at McDonald's, you know, with your cell phone and just a couple of hits, QR code, and boom, uh, you know, $10 million is, is gone. And what Peter Thiel did, uh, and it was right, I mean, I'm not criticizing him, he got his own money up, but he, he sent out like an SOS to Silicon Valley. He said, all of you, whoever you are, get your money out now. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of people did, and that was that $40 billion. So so the time the time frame is becoming more, more compressed because of technology. You're exactly right about that, which means that the response function has to be equally compressed or else you are going to have all the consequences of a, you know, an honest to goodness global financial crisis. So, and I'm not sure if everyone knows the sequence, but on Friday night, March 10th, the FDIC um, took over Silicon Valley Bank and they issued a press release and they said, here's what we're doing. Um, we're taking over. Uh, we're putting it into what's called a receivership. Um, anyone with $250,000 or less, your deposits are fully insured. No, no worries. You'll have your money Monday morning and over $250,000, your deposits are gone. They didn't say frozen. They didn't say suspended. They said gone. And they gave you a receivership certificate, basically a, an unsecured printed up IOU from the FDIC, but not money. And it's a receivership certificate. And they said, hang on to them. Uh, in effect, um, we're going to sell assets. Uh, and as and when we realize proceeds from assets, we'll give you something. We'll give you distributions on these things. Don't know how much, don't know when. We'll do the best we can. Remember in the RTC days in the early 90s, uh, they, it took them two years and they were, they were very efficient. I worked with them at the time They we were in their offices when we were sitting on boxes because they didn't even have furniture, but they were doing deals. So they had the right, the right attitude, but that took two years. So, um, uh, and that was it. Well, that's when the, that's when I call the uh, the billionaire crybabies came out in force. Uh, you know, Bill Ackman, all these guys. Oh, you got to save us! You know, and I'm like, well, you got to trade on Bill. I mean, you know, five billion is not enough. But anyway, they pounded on the White House all weekend. Now, here here's something that very few people say. Almost nobody knew at the time, except the management. Although they seemed to be asleep at the switch. Everyone's like, yes, yeah, startups, venture capital. And then there's a lot of truth to that. Ninety seven percent of the deposits of Silicon Valley Bank were uninsured. And by the way, that's my new metric for assessing banks. You used to look at, you know, working capital and debt equity ratios and, you know, bad, bad assets, governments. There are lots of ways to measure the health of a bank. But the most relevant way right now is, and this is publicly available, take the ratio of uninsured deposits to total deposits. 30% is comfortable. If you're like, I guess, you know, 70% of my deposits are insured, which means they're not panicky. They're not necessarily going to run for the hills. 30%, okay, uninsured, but I have assets. I have, I have that much cash or more. That's a comfortable ratio. When you get over 50, you're in the danger zone. Well, Silicon Valley Bank was 97% uninsured, which meant all the money was going to run. And it did. So that's the way, if you're looking at these big banks or, uh, um, you know, any, any institution or your own savings institution to, to look at it. But, um, but Silicon Valley Bank was a climate bank. Were they investing in startups? Yes. Were they investing in technology? Yes. But these were climate. These were green new scam, uh, uh, startups. 
looking at you know battery technology uh you know the chemi- chemistry physics you know to try to make a better battery but not much improvement in the battery in in 200 years but um uh, there's they're working on it um you know wind turbines um uh, you know other sustainable fuel alternatives etc again i'm not do that if you like if that's your field of research but so much is subsidized by the government and then further subsidized by silicon valley bank and that's where the that's where the assets were that's where the loans were by and large and so the white house is getting hammered not only because of entrepreneurs job losses and by the way we are in an election cycle here in the united states yeah. but from the greenies who are extremely powerful so within so that was friday night so saturday everyone's crying to the white house sunday night at six o'clock by the mark that on your calendar sunday 6 p.m is when they tell you what they're going to do you know they you know uh, 6 p.m sunday november 12th they came out on uh sorry march 12th they came out on uh silicon valley bank the following week 19th that was credit swiss hey, Brian, so let's go back to um uh, either brazil mexico argentina the latin american debt crisis broadly defined in the early 1980s that that played out at the intense phase lasted about three years you know 82 83 84 it wasn't until 1990 that we got around to brady bonds which were the ultimate refancy, refinancing technique but the intense period lasted about three years come forward to 1998 long-term capital management that uh, was about three months that was uh, july august september 1998 svb was three days or less it was like wednesday thursday friday and done um and you know, i i talked to a guy i know we no reason to mention names but you know uh um runs runs a very one of the largest uh endowments uh in the world and he said jim we moved uh we we were moving eight billion dollars out of silicon valley bank and we got the wire transfer request in but we didn't know because you know you get to close business thursday we didn't know until sunday that the money was going to move we got a confirmation on monday we didn't end up moving the money but there was this about a 48 hour period there from friday to sunday when no one knew that the thing the wires had been completed the recipients didn't have them it was just in limbo um and uh uh you know and it worked out um one of the big crypto promoters um they um uh, uh, forget the name of, well the particular name of the bank but they back one of the uh um one of the stable coins actually it's usdc yeah. uh had three three billion dollars in silicon valley bank and they talked about you know all these small entrepreneurs and startups they got 100 employees and five million working capital and that money's gone and they're all going to fail there was something to that but uh the fact is you had roku uh uh cisco uh ebay i mean there were huge companies with multi-billion dollar deposits in that bank it wasn't all uh all a bunch of little guys so um but yeah you can uh yeah, in the old days you have the lineup around the the block and maybe it was raining you're standing there in the rain waiting for your turn to get up to the tower now you can be in line at mcdonald's you know with your cell phone and just a couple hits qr code and boom uh you know 10 million dollars is gone and what peter thiel did uh and it was right i mean i'm not criticizing him he got his own money up but he he sent out like an sos to silicon valley he said all of you whoever you are get your money out now uh and a lot of, a lot of people did and that was that 40 billion dollars so so the time the time frame is becoming more more compressed because of technology you're exactly right about that which means that the response function has to be equally compressed or else you are going to have all the consequences of a you know an honest to goodness global financial crisis so and i'm not sure if everyone knows the sequence but on friday night march 10th the fdic um took over silicon valley bank and they issued a press release and they said here's what we're doing um we're taking over uh we're putting it into what's called a receivership um anyone with two hundred fifty thousand dollars or less your deposits are full insured no no worries you'll have your money monday morning and over two hundred fifty thousand dollars your deposits are gone they didn't say frozen they didn't say suspended they said gone and they gave you a receivership certificate basically a, an unsecured printed up iou from the fdic but not money and it's a receivership certificate and they said hang on to them uh in effect um we're going to sell assets uh and as and when we realize proceeds from assets we'll give you something we'll give you distributions on these things don't know how much don't know when we'll do the best we can remember in the rtc days in the early 90s uh they it took them two years and they were they were very efficient i worked with them at the time they we were in their offices when we were sitting on boxes because they didn't even have furniture but they were doing deals so they had the right the right attitude but that took two years so um uh and that was it 
Well, that's when the, that's when I called the uh, the billionaire crybabies came out in force. Uh, you know, Bill Ackman, all these guys. Oh, you got to save us! You know, and I was like, well, you got to trade on Bill. <laughs> Five billion is not enough. But anyway, they pounded on the White House all weekend. Now, here here's something that very few people I say almost nobody knew at the time, except the management. Although they seem to be asleep at the switch. Everyone's like, yeah, startups, venture capital. And then there's a lot of truth to that. Ninety seven percent of the deposits of silicon valley bank were uninsured and by the way that's my new metric for assessing banks you used to look at you know working capital and debt equity ratios and you know bad bad assets governments there are lots of ways to measure the health of a bank but the most relevant way right now is and this is publicly available take the ratio of uninsured deposits to total deposits 30 percent is comfortable if you're like I guess, you know 70 percent of my deposits are insured which means they're not panicky they're not necessarily going to run for the hills 30 percent okay uninsured but i have assets i have i have that much cash or more that's a comfortable ratio when you get over 50 you're in the danger zone well silicon valley bank was 97 percent uninsured which meant all the money was going to run and it did so that's the way if you're looking at these big banks or uh um you know any any institution or your own savings institution to to look at it but um but silicon valley bank was a climate bank were they investing in startups yes were they investing in technology yes but these were climate these were green new scam uh uh startups looking at you know battery technology uh you know the chemi chemistry physics you know to try to make a better battery but not much improvement in the battery in in 200 years but uh there's they're working on it um you know wind turbines uh you know other sustainable fuel alternatives etc again i'm not do that if you like if that's your field of research but so much as is subsidized by the government and then further subsidized by silicon valley bank and that's where the that's where the assets were that's where the loans were by and large and so the white house is getting hammered not only because of entrepreneurs job losses and by the way we are in an election cycle here in the united states yeah but from the greenies who are extremely powerful so within so that was friday night so saturday everyone's crying to the white house sunday night at six o'clock by the mark that on your calendar sunday 6 p.m is when they tell you what they're going to do you know they you know uh, 6 p.m sunday november 12th they came out on uh sorry march 12th they came out on uh silicon valley bank the following week 19th that was credit swiss the math and the science behind diversification and why it's a good strategy is very clear that's not much debate about that the problem is people don't understand what diversification means they think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors semiconductors consumer non durables or whatever they're diversified and what i say to them is you may have 50 stocks but that's one asset class you're in stocks and in stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does a diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, uh, a marathon, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, Cargill, um, uh, you know, uh, mining companies uh and not just gold gold yeah but um i recently invested in a lithium mine uh I, I the green new deal i call it the green new scam uh, and this is a scam but it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs whether it's whether you like it or not the fact is uh it's going to go on so the lithium's in short supply uh graphite you know etc so there is a portfolio you can have which is natural resource oriented that will do well even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about slug of cash absolutely maybe as much as 30 percent I like treasury notes, 10 year treasury notes, but you know, season to taste. If it's, if they're a little too volatile, look at five year notes, two year notes. They're going to come down a lot, not right away, not tomorrow morning, but um, sooner than later because of everything we discussed, which is, uh, you know, recession and interest rates will follow. They're a lagging indicator, but that'll happen. Bonds, particularly the, the sovereign bonds, especially the US treasuries, they're looking the best they've seen in, in a long while. and and. You know, relatively recently, some have said it's like the best I've seen in my career. So I'm just curious: does do you find that compelling for the moment in time we're in here? Absolutely. There's a hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math, but there's something called a DBO one. DBO one is the dollar value of one basis point. What that means is, you know, obviously basic bond math: interest rates come down, the value, of the, the price of the bond goes up. They're just invert. It's a little counterintuitive, but the question is how much. And the lower the interest rate the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates. Mm. So in other words, if you go from 9% to 8%, you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond. But if you go from 3% to 2%, 
it's still a 1% drop, but you're going to have a much bigger capital gain. You know, in, in each instance, it's a 1% drop in rates, but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher. In other words, the DBO1 is higher when the rates are lower. Again, it's all counterintuitive. The lower the rate, the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop in yields. Yep. That's the basic thing. So yeah, when you're, you, you go from 3% to 2%, that's a home run in terms of capital gains. So you get the yield, you get the safety, you get the liquidity. And if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Gold, I always recommend 10% slice. But based on what we were talking about, I would get silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah, the monster box, that's, uh, you know, a bit of jargon. Monster box comes from the US mints, treasury green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it, you know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire. But inside are 500 one ounce American silver eagles. That's a lot. They'll feed your family for probably a year. Yeah, you know, it's a market price, be around ten, twelve thousand uh, dollars for a monster box. But to me, it's like battery and flashlight. I like them both, and you know, I talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money, and uh, I do the monetary analysis. Uh, I mean, I do invest in gold mines, but I don't hold myself out as a geologist. But I do think about it from a monetary perspective. And then people always say, Jim, what about silver? What about silver? I'm like, look, if, if gold soars the way I expect, silver is along for the ride. There's, there's no, there's not going to be a world of $3,000 gold and $20 silver. That world doesn't exist. If gold's at $3,000, silver's going to be pushing 100. So without giving an exact forecast, uh, silver will be along for the ride. Silver is a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications. Gold really doesn't. Gold's not good for anything except money, but it's the best form of money. Silver can be, is used in a lot of applications. So if you have a recession, it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the eight gram coin I mentioned, the quarter ounce American Gold Eagle, still 500 bucks. It's like pulling a $500 bill out of your wallet. You know, it's, it's a lot for groceries. Home prices are coming down a little more in some markets than others, but uh, if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a place like, you know, uh, someplace people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know they're, 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but, you know, it's like buying a, a 10 year bond. You know, it's got steady monthly income and uh, or certainly farmland, uh, but in income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes. I like private equity and it's, you know, you got accredited investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management, but you know, some good deals in the mining sector. Um, I like uh, well, that, 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 that would be one. I, mean, I want to talk to you real quickly about the current state of media. I, I just love to hear your thoughts on this because I, I know this is something that you care about, that you've written about a bit. Um, and, uh, and you're playing a role in trying to give people, you know, more accurate, more nutritious, more actionable information than, than what they're able to get from the new sources that they're just directed to by society. Um, if you talk about what they call legacy media, mainstream media, so Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, right. CNN, that run of characters. The first thing you discover is I know a lot of these people. I've been on all these programs. I know this for a long time. I spent a lot of time in Washington. I had dinner with most of the, or lunch or whatever, dinner actually more often with most of the names you've heard about. Um, some of them are fine. Some of them are nice. A lot of them are either not that bright or, I mean, they're good on camera you know, or whatever. They got a desk at the Washington Post. They're not that bright. Or if they've got some degrees, they've been kind of indoctrinated. We're at the point now. Uh, I mean, a lot of these people are, 28, 33, 34 years old. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, good. You're, you're in the heart of your career. But that means they graduated from school in, uh, you know, 2016, 2017 or whatever. Um, and they're thoroughly indoctrinated. Uh, I'm, I, I, um, I mean, I went to school when uh, uh, we, learned, we learned it was pretty rigorous. I mean, I, I had one program where the, they graded, you needed a C plus average to graduate but they graded on a C minus curve. So you're like, well, how do you get it? How do you, how do you even get a C plus if they're writing on a C minus curve? And the answer is people quit. And in, the, in other words, you were, you were trying to struggle to be, I did get an A in partnership taxation. And I'm proud of that. But my, the standards are down. The mission standards are down. Affirmative action takes over. When you get into the classroom, I don't care where you're at, you know, Ivy League, whatever, it's just indoctrination. The market has a way of sorting it out. I mean, 
the revenues are down, advertising's down, the viewers are down, subscriptions are down. Eventually, they will go out of business, not overnight, and then new media channels will arise. And you know, there's a lot of garbage on the internet, but there's a lot of good stuff. And um, you know, if you want to keep tabs on the war in Ukraine, you have to know where to look. It's not easy, but there are a number of channels with. And I'm talking about you know, military officers, you know, colonels, you know, brigadier generals. Um, people on the ground in Ukraine, not, you know, some studio in New York, you can find out what's going on. But I think my intelligence training is helpful because you have to be very persistent and know how to dig. I spent a lot of time on the Fed. And the question is, okay, what about June? They got, you know, six more meetings this year. So here's the Fed's dilemma and it, it's playing out in real time. So Jay Powell gave, I lost count, seven or eight speeches. And they said the same thing every time. He said, inflation is job one. We're on a path to raise interest rates. We're not going to quit until inflation is under control. Now, there's a little wiggle room around that. Their target is two. They actually look at personal consumption expenditure year over year core. That's their metric. There are 15 ways to measure inflation, but that's the one they like. But even that is still over close to five. It's a long way from two. That's the point. You're trying to get to two. They're a long way from two. But there's something called the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? Well, no one knows the number. I don't know because Jay Powell doesn't know. So we're all estimating. But um, the terminal rate, it's a rate that's high enough to bring down inflation on its own without further rate hikes. Knows we can stop here and confident that inflation is going to come down without doing more. Because the conundrum is, okay, they've been raising rates since March 2022. Monetary policy works with a lag. Inflation peaked in July 2022, and it has been coming down ever since. You know, some of the some months were, you know, January was hot compared to December, but the trend has been down. So they're raising rates and inflation is coming down. So that's good. But here's what they don't know. Was inflation coming down because they were raising rates or had they already hit the terminal rate and they just didn't know it? Because Wall Street was like, no, you've hit the terminal rate. Stop, please stop. You got this under control. The Fed doesn't believe that. One of the greatest blunders in monetary policy was Paul Volcker in 1980, who had started raising rates in 1979 and inflation was coming down. But then in 1980, we had a very sharp recession that had nothing to do with monetary policy. It wasn't caused by Paul Volcker. Jimmy Carter put a cap on credit card interest and everyone Banks stopped issuing credit cards. Well, that'll that'll sink the economy. And then so Volcker reacted to that by lowering interest rates seven percentage points, not 70 basis points, seven percentage points, because we're in a recession, right? That's what Feds do, the Fed chairs do. But because it was a regulatory blunder, they fixed it and the economy came roaring back. And then inflation really took off worse than when Volcker got in in 79, early 1980. So Volcker had to take rates to 20% to get inflation under control the second time after cutting them in 1980. And that's called the Volcker mistake or the Volcker blunder. And Volcker himself, I spoke to him, he said, yeah, that was, that was a mistake that I should have stuck. I should have stuck to my program, not worried about the economy and unemployment, but just got inflation under control. But when he threw in the towel prematurely, the inflation went to the moon. Jay Powell doesn't want to be that guy. Jay Powell knows that episode as well as I do. And he doesn't want to be the guy who throws in the towel early and then inflation just goes to the moon and then he's got it. Then he has to take interest rates to 15% or something ridiculous. So Wall Street's saying, you're already there, mission accomplished. Powell's saying, not so fast. They told Volcker that and he cut rates and it was an enormous mistake. So Powell's not going to be that guy. So what is the terminal rate today? I would say five and a half because we had we had a lot of hot data, you know, unemployment down, uh, job creation up, retail sales up, not to the moon, but these are the opposite of what Powell is looking for. So he's had no confirmation that inflation is coming down on his own. He's had a lot of data that says inflation may be getting ready to take off again. So you got to say the terminal rate went from five and a quarter to five and a half, maybe more. Let's you know see what he does in June. And Powell always said, I don't care if there's a recession. I don't care if there's unemployment because the long-term costs of inflation are going to be much greater than those short-term problems. We got to suffer through that to get a bigger problem under control. He thinks of inflation. He said this many, many times. Now, along comes Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. Oh, by the way, in addition to raising rates, don't forget QT, quantitative tightening. They were shrinking their balance sheet. It's very hard to estimate the monetary impact of shrinking the balance sheet, but the best estimate is for every trillion dollars you take it down, it's probably equal to a one percentage point hike in the Fed funds rate. So the tightening has been more than just taking the Fed funds rate up. You also have to take into account QT. Now let's go back to the, the bond, the bond guarantee bailing out the entire banking system. 
The Fed proceeded to guarantee every deposit and every bank in the entire U.S. banking system. Here we're talking, you know, six or seven trillion dollars of assets. And the way they did it was um, a lot of other banks, you know, big ones and small ones, at least the big ones that had good risk management, but a lot of small, medium sized banks, they had the same problem Silicon Valley Bank had. Maybe the depositors weren't work, walking out the door, or maybe they weren't funding tech startups, but they had underwater bonds and overnight deposits and were facing the same thing. So the Fed said, okay, all you banks, if you send us your bonds, we'll give you cash. Okay, that's just a normal discount operation, but that will give you cash equivalent to the par value. So again, remember the market value is like 80 cents on the dollar, but the Fed says, we'll give you 100 cents on the dollar. So now you ship your bonds to the Fed, they give you not 100%, which is like low collateral, but they give you 120%. So the banks are shipping in bonds that are worth 80 cents on the dollar. Why wouldn't you do that? I'm like, hey, hey, Fed, if you want to give me a low, low interest rate bridge loan uh, with 80% down, I'll take all you got. So now, the banks are going to are going to do that. And by the way, there's no because it's structured kind of like a repurchase agreement. There's no sale. So they don't have to market to market. If you sold it to a third party, a dealer, you would you'd have to take the loss. But now they don't have to take the loss. So they're shipping in billions, potentially a trillion dollars or more of these bonds. They're not getting 80, 90 cents on the dollar, which is what they're worth. They're getting 100 cents on the dollar, which was the original purchase price. They don't have to take the loss and they're getting cash. Why wouldn't you do that all day long? So in effect, they bailed out the entire banking system to the tune of trillions of dollars. They've just blew up the $250,000 limit. Forget that. I mean, I know what the statute says, but they threw that out the window. And uh, the, the moral hazard, the economic consequences, the repercussions of this are kind of unimaginable. I mean, I can sketch them. I can talk about them. You know, to hear Janet Yellen say it's not a bailout. Are you kidding me? This is the biggest bailout in history. And I, you know, I, I negotiated the LTCM bailout. I, I lived through that. That was a trillion dollars of derivatives. Uh, and through 2008, 2020, the pandemic, I go back to 1994, the Mexican tequila crisis. I've, I've lived through all of these and been more or less directly involved in all of them. And this is orders of magnitude greater in terms of what's being bailed out. Doesn't that mean that a lot of banks will be sending the bonds to the Fed and getting cash? Yes, yeah, exactly what it means. Well, where's the cash come from? You got to print it. So on the one hand, we're doing quantitative tightening by letting bonds mature and not reinvesting. But on the other hand, you just send an open invitation, open party, house party to every bank in the country saying, send us your bonds and we'll give you cash. Not only that, but hundred cents on the dollar, even if they're worth 80. So, so you're going to have potentially trillions of dollars of new money being printed at a time when the Fed's trying to get inflation under control and they were trying to shrink the balance sheet, they're going to be expanding the balance sheet. So, I mean, there's no way out. There's no good way out of this. You can pause. Uh, I don't think they will, but you could pause and not raise rates, right? And implicitly saying we're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future because we got all these losses in the banks. Okay, inflation goes to the moon. I promise you it'll just take off like a rocket. Or you can raise interest rates 25 basis points and we'll continue this war on inflation, but you're just going to increase the bond losses in the banks and make them send you more bonds and get more cash. Or the third thing is just take away the, the umbrella and let all these banks fail. I mean, it's like name your poison, name your poison. You can have runaway inflation, severe acute banking crisis, or basically a lot more, as I say, a lot more bank failures uh, and, and a severe recession because you're going to keep raising rates. There are three choices, but none of them are good. Inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, having said that, the target is 2%. So he's, he's not there, but he's making progress. Now, Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want to give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's subjective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. And right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So my expectation is the Fed will raise interest rates 25 basis points in March. March 22nd is the Fed meeting after that. Well, that gets you to five and a quarter. And even the hawk, more hawkish members think that that's probably the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed 
have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, probably two more hikes, and then we'll pause. And then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street, and I'll say markets, not just Wall Street, but the big money in places like uh, the euro dollar futures curve and, and the U.S. Treasury curve, which are highly inverted, are saying, no, you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause, going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. And you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street... With the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. And everyone knows, you know, Volcker became Fed chairman in 1979. He, he stayed on until the um, early to mid 80s. Uh, and he did raise interest rates to 20% or very close to it to kill inflation, which went up to 15% uh, at the time. But people forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then, and then uh, they took the ceiling off and then things got back to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker... Uh, not quite panic, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which, number one, was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, he, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember, Powell's not an economist. He's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won. Because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger. And then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then. But at the time, that was horrific. But Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So so the question is, how does this play out? In my view, Hal probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest. The unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. You know, as I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. They think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year. There are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is, it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. 
and it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. Both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Now, and again, this is what my book Sold Out is about, the breakdown of the supply chain, partly related to energy, partly related to the war in Ukraine, partly related to the pandemic panic. Uh, as I explained in the book, it actually predates that. The breakdown started in 2018 with Trump's trade war. And then... COVID made it worse, yes. Ukrainian war made it worse, yes. But it, it really started before that. So, of course, prices went up and people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed. And energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. And basically, consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. And so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s, and Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. Here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. So it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. So it, it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand, and hurt the economy. Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. When you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. What I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they use a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third-party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them and run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets, so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the rupee aren't going to replace anything. Well, the repercussions may be felt for 10 years or longer, uh, but the the, uh, the immediate impact is going to go well beyond um, uh, you know the so-called sanctions. What the point I was really making was we're slapping sanctions on Russia. Russia is hitting back with some retaliatory actions, uh, and it's pretty easy to, to look at the direct impact of that, but there's second order and third order effects that will pop up all over the world and could very quickly get out of control. It, think of it as the economic equivalent of a nuclear war. Nobody wants a nuclear war. Uh, but the, they, the, the one thing they all said in common, the one thing they all shared was, don't go there. And what they meant was that nobody wakes up and says, oh, gee, I think I'll start a nuclear war today. What a good idea. That, that never happens. What does happen is you get into an escalatory situation, back and forth and back and forth, where you're escalating and escalating, and you end up in a nuclear war. You never intended it, never started out that way. But you end up there through escalation. Now take that, and that, that, that is good analysis. Take that 
and apply it to what is now, I would say, the first full-scale economic war, uh, sanctions war. We've had sanctions, you know, for a long time, and we go back to the at least the 70s with with Iran. But even before that, I mean, FDR put sanctions on Japan. Nothing on this scale. This is uh, unprecedented in its scope and application. Uh, and my only point is, it, it, the effects of this are going to not just last a long time. Yes. But they're going to pop up in very, very unexpected places. Um, I, I did. It, uh, let me make the, let me make the point. This was uh, there was never a war that was easier to prevent. There was, there's never been a war that's easier to prevent, and there's never been a war that's easier to end. Uh, the, you could end this war in 48 hours or less. Uh, having said that, I did expect that through a series of policy blunders and escalation, in this case military escalation and political escalation. And then later in the book, around on page 250 or so, I have a whole section on Ukraine, Russia, and natural gas. So this has been brewing for a long time. Um, you can go back to the 2008 Bucharest Declaration, but if you, if you want to pick one thing and say, hey, when, when did this thing take a turn for the worse? Right. So that we were on a path to war. That was the color revolution sponsored by Obama and Biden. Um, which was a coup d'etat. I mean, the, the president of Ukraine at the time, he was pro-Russian, and Obama set out to depose him, and they did. And they put in Poroshenko, who was a U.S. puppet, and at the same time, like a month, well, two months after the color revolution, one month before Poroshenko, uh, Putin took Crimea. He said, okay, that's how you want to play, fine. Uh, you, throw, you move away from neutrality, move towards NATO, NATO I'll take Crimea, your move. And then there was nothing to... Putin didn't take one square inch during the Trump administration, because Trump is, Trump is highly unpredictable, but put Biden back in, who was part of the original Obama-Biden team. And so not only was Trump not in Putin's pocket, uh, he was the only one who stood up to Putin in such a way that Putin didn't take one square inch of territory. He took Crimea under Obama. Now he's taking kind of half the country under Biden. Didn't take anything under Trump. So that completely debunks that. But just to take it one step further, who is in the pocket of um, of the of the Ukrainians, at least? And the answer is Joe Biden, because of Hunter Biden, who made millions of dollars from Burisma, the large natural gas company. Ukraine is ranked uh, in the low 90s of the of the most corrupt countries in the world. In other words, the it's at the bottom on a corruption list with the best with the, with the most honest countries being on top. Um, Ukraine is very close to the bottom. It's it's the most corrupt country in Europe, one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Zelensky is just another oligarch, just another phony. Uh, now, you can take sides, but to me, Putin's a dictator, Zelensky's a dictator. You know, pick your dictator. But um, this idea that he's some, you know, good guy Democrat is nonsense. Well, it's a phone call, basically. I mean, Biden, uh, Biden's kind of non compass mentis, but somebody with uh, who can, you know, string a few sentences together needs to call Zelensky and say, um, here's what we're going to do. You, you're not going to join NATO. Well, we'll get the, the NATO Secretary General, John, John Stoltenberg, uh, to say that. You need to say it. The U.S. will say it. So you're not going to join NATO. You're not going to join the EU. You can be independent in the sense of being autonomous, but you have to be neutral. When, when you've got two great powers, whether it's the U.S. and Russia or um, the U.S. plus Europe and Russia confronting each other, uh, the idea of buffer states, I mean, that's as old as, uh, you know, the, if not history, uh, at least the, the history of buffer states is uh, several centuries old at this point. It's, it's a part of what every international uh, strategist uh, looks at. So Ukraine should be a buffer state. It should be neutral. Uh, that way Putin has no reason to invade and we have no reason to try to push the borders of NATO to a point slightly east of Moscow, which uh, Moscow hasn't been attacked from the east since Genghis Khan. Peace sanctions will not work to stop the war or slow the war or change the outcome of the war. Now, they absolutely punish the Russian economy, yep. They punish Russian individuals, consumers, Russian citizens. They're going to have fewer options, uh, more expensive goods, um, you know, their economy is going to slow down, unemployment will go up, the ruble is devalued. All those things are true, but they're also true in the United States. We're going to punish Americans far worse than the Russians. Uh, we're already seeing, I took a long trip yesterday, uh, I filled up my car with, with gas at the end of the trip, it was $76. Inflation's here, uh, we all see it, uh, you know, price of gasoline, uh, eggs, milk, butter, groceries at the store, um, rents, electricity, uh, home heating, uh, you know, fuel, uh, you name it, across the board, inflation's affecting everything. 
Um, and it started uh, really in uh, mid-2021. So here we are, uh, almost 2023. So it's been going on for well over a year. Uh, for the first six or seven months, you know, Jay Powell and for that matter, Janet Yellen were like, yeah, we see it, but it's transitory, transitory. We know that story. Finally, in November 2021, Jay Powell threw in the towel, uh, said, okay, time time to retire the word transitory. Now let's get to work. And they um, started raising interest rates in uh, March 2022. And we're now up to uh, Fed funds rate of 4%. Uh, they're going to raise them again in December, uh, December 14th by another 50 basis points. We kind of, you know, still a little bit away from that, but we know it's coming. The Fed, this is the no drama Fed. They tell you what they're doing in advance. So uh, I always say you don't you don't need a crystal ball to figure out the Fed. You just need to listen to what they're saying and believe them. So they're, they're going to do 50 basis points in uh, December. That'll get the um, uh, policy rate of the Fed funds uh, target rate to four and a half percent. But that's from zero. March 1st, it was zero. So to go from zero to four and a half in less than nine months, uh, about eight and a half months, that's amazing. We haven't seen anything like that since uh, uh, Paul Volcker in, in the early 80s. Now, I know rates are not 13, 14%, but, um, but to go from zero to four and a half, I can say in eight months is, uh, is a shock. Now, what's, why is the Fed doing this? Well, they, they say they want to kill inflation. Okay. But, um, there are two sources of inflation. Inflation can come from the supply side, um, what's called cost push inflation. Costs go up and they get pushed into um, uh, you know, re retail prices and, and consumer prices. Uh, and that is what's happening. That's because of the supply chain breakdown, energy uh, prices, shortages of goods, et cetera. So that's cost push inflation from the supply side. There's another kind of inflation that comes from the demand side. And this is much more psychological. It's when consumers say, you know, they just have it in their heads and maybe from objective data that prices are going up. And so they change the behavior. They say, you know, I was thinking of getting a new washing machine, but uh, I was going to wait six months, but I better buy it now because the price is going to be a lot higher in six months or a car, or, you know, suit of clothes, a dress, uh, furniture, whatever it is, better buy it now because the price is going to go up. It's going to get worse. Inflation is here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative place to put money. You can buy gold, you can buy a 10 year treasury note. So what's been true since last summer is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971. And I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. 
with the United States and sterling. I think it was four seventy-five. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, four four pounds and and change. And as late as World War One, say nineteen thirteen, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to you know, at the time, Bombay, today, Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is, is about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce, it's a quarter ounce, because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you going to do with a one ounce coin? It's worth, you know, almost $2,000. Uh, you know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold. Um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK, or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank. And they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made four hundred ounce bars. And they said, Don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money. Uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh by the way, they're four hundred ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a four hundred ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy. They weigh about thirty five pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the nineteen thirties. The central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first, the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. And the Federal Reserve System told all the banks, hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold. But people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three... Uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and, you know, hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And it's there. And look on the, look in the assets. And the first line item is gold certificate, and it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that, that $11 billion is actually worth $470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of $450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet, represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold. The Treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two Army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the Army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an Army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money. But of course, it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, you know, I'm just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics. 
and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously. In the U.S., we still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half. No, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. Inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, having said that, the target is 2%. So he's, he's not there, but he's making progress. Now, Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want to give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's subjective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates? Or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. And right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate and then we'll pause. And then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street and I'll say markets, not just Wall Street, but the big money in places like uh, the euro dollar futures curve and, and the U.S. Treasury curve, which are highly inverted, are saying, no, you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. And you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. And everyone knows, you know, Volcker became Fed chairman in 1979. He, he stayed on until the um, early to mid 80s. Uh, and he did raise interest rates to 20 percent or very close to it to kill inflation, which went up to 15 percent uh, at the time. But people forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then, and then uh, they took the ceiling off and then things got back to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, he, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember Powell's not an economist, he's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, 
before the battle against inflation is won. Because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger, and then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So, so the question is, how does this play out? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, if you want to for forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest, the unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. You know, as I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. They think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year, there are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. Both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Now, and again, this is what my book Sold Out is about, the breakdown of the supply chain, partly related to energy, partly related to the war in Ukraine, partly related to the pandemic panic. Uh, as I explained in the book, it actually predates that. The breakdown started in 2018 with Trump's trade war. And then COVID made it worse, yes. Ukrainian war made it worse, yes. But it, it really started before that. So, of course, prices went up and people were trying to pay whatever they had to, to get what they needed. And energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. And basically consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. And so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s in Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. But here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. So it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. So it, it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand and hurt the economy. And then it slows down and then the inflation comes down on its own. That appears to be happening. But Powell hasn't really made the distinction. He's still, he's fighting the last war, I hate to use a cliche, but he's fighting the Volcker war. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle's not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there. The future is very positive for gold. Uh, you have the normal vectors, you know, uh, supply is flat, 
it has been for six years. Demand is going up. Central banks have flipped from net sellers to net buyers. That's a big deal. Um, and a retail institutional interest is higher. So that's good. Geopolitical threats don't need to say a lot, you know, from the U.S. perspective, Iran, China, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, you name it. So that's the vector. But the biggest driver right now is what I referred to a few minutes ago, negative real rates. Because gold, as a form of money, which is how I view it, competes with other interest rate, c- competes with other instruments, treasury bills, et cetera. Well, if they have high yields and gold has no yield, you want the treasury bills. But if uh, if interest rates have negative yields and gold is just flat, gold looks more attractive. So that's the main driver, and that's going to continue. Everyone's like, well, you know, the gold is up, gold is down. Uh, but when that, so what do you mean when you say that? And they're talking about the dollar price of gold. And it's like, okay, so the dollar price of gold is up or down. That's really a cross rate. That's so different than talking about the euro, US dollar exchange rate or, or Australian dollar, US dollar exchange rate. If you think of gold as money, and I do, then the dollar price of gold with gold measured by weight, not as another currency, uh, it is another form of money, but with gold measured by weight, it's a cross exchange rate. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor, as a bank, I think of it by weight. Because when someone says gold's really going up, I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say, gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more, and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when you, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, there's a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numerator. The numerator is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever? And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. And so when you say gold is going up, let's say it went to $2,000 an ounce. It was, oh, the price of gold went up, you know, just went up uh, 10%. Um, Well, did it or did the dollar go down? Uh, the way I would phrase it is, you know, it used to be $1,800 to get an ounce of gold. Now it's $2,000 to get an ounce of gold or, you know, your dollar got you one eighteen hundredth of an ounce. Today, it only gets you one two thousandth of an ounce. Uh, in other words, gold didn't do anything. It's a metal. It's an element, atomic number 79. What happened was the, the dollar got stronger. So a stronger dollar is a lower dollar price for gold and a weaker dollar is a higher dollar price for gold. So when people talk about gold going up, what they're really talking about is the dollar going down. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year, records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are they are Russia and China. Now, now China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons, US was down a thousand tons after losing uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one. Literally one month, their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons well you know the market you, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month not not one country in one order but they had it all along but they decided to reveal it put it on their balance sheet so uh americans don't seem to like gold i'm not sure canadians feel much differently or others around the world uh but central banks sure do and i think that tells you something
There's huge demand for dollars all over the world, not because of the currency, but because of collateral, because of treasury bills. Banks need treasury bills to pledge as collateral for derivatives. It's the best collateral in the world. Um, and if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to leverage your balance sheet as much as you would like. You're not going to be as profitable. You're not going to be able to support lending and investing, which is what banks in theory are supposed to do. So to support the bloat of balance sheets and to support the derivatives, you need collateral. And the better the collateral, the more leverage you can have. The best collateral in the world is a treasury bill. And so there's a mad scramble for treasury bills, which means there's a mad scramble for dollars to buy treasury bills. And that is coming from European banks, it's coming from Chinese banks um, and banks around the world, but primarily European and Chinese. And that's not going away. So it's, it's, it's funny to hear people, or people think it's funny to hear anyone talk about a dollar collateral shortage, like, hey, haven't you flooded the world with dollars? Hasn't the Fed printed $9 trillion? And the answer is they have. But that's not the measure. It's, it's, a, it's a high multiple of that. It's the dollar value of all the collateral. Because in the repo markets, you know, I pledge the collateral to you and then you pledge it to somebody else, one of our colleagues, and then she pledges it to somebody else, et cetera. That collateral gets pledged 50 times and supports not one dollar a balance sheet, but fifty dollars a balance sheet for a dollar of collateral. And so you restrict the collateral, you're restricting the balance sheet. The dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a it's a currency. So all of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. I can give you 20 reasons why the dollar should go down, but I'll give you one big reason why it won't, which is the demand for collateral. And so that's keeping the dollar constant, which is keeping the dollar price of gold constant because gold doesn't change and the dollar's not changing. Now that'll break um, and that'll break in favor of gold, meaning the dollar will get a lot weaker. It'll have to, but it's gonna take a few months at least because the US economy has to get weaker, which it is. The Fed will figure this out maybe by September, like next September. Um, and uh, then they'll ease a little bit and they'll try to weaken the dollar to try to give the U.S. economy a boost, but we're not there yet. So it's going to be now that that doesn't mean the price of gold is going down a lot. I'm just saying it's not going to go up a lot. It's going to chug along kind of sideways. But when it breaks, it's going to break big to the upside because the dollar is going to go to the downside. But that's probably at least um, still a few months away, maybe longer.